interest to bring up this capacity, but additional capacity costs more, sorry for that, than the original capacity set up, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, because you know what the construction index, uh, price index, and so on is, and it's getting with all the environmental requests and all the other topics it's getting more and more expensive. So we have a topic uh, to invest on the one side roughly over the next uh, five to ten years, uh, four billion for the extension to bring up the capacity by 50 percent. From nowadays 80, 83 movements per hour up to 126 movements per hour, or from roughly 50 million passengers uh, to 88 million passengers and so on. And on the other side, here on the right side of the slide, we invest roughly two to three billion euro in um, modernization of the actual um, terminal uh, environment uh, for the next generation and uh, um, additional terminal capacity, but also in fleet adjustments required by the airlines, A380, 777, and so on. Or, and that's the biggest problem there, um, regulations we got from the EU, regulations we got out of national um, um, uh, topics, fire protection and so on, which don't bring direction, di uh, direct value. An indirect value, of course, but there's no direct value, but we have to finance this and uh, at the end you need a return on this uh, because otherwise we have no incentive and I think we had this discussion this morning to set up additional capacity for the public interest. What we have a topic is and that's a question how to regulate this, that to make it very simple, that uh, a decision for an extension of airport capacity has been taken, in Germany at least, and probably it's in most uh, instances also the same in Europe, has been taken 10 years ago. And we have already financed roughly 1 billion investments uh, for the new capacity, which is still not in place. It will be in place in two years from now, but it will not be used uh, immediately with 100% of the, of the capacity. So we will grow into the capacity and then we're on the question how to finance this. And we had this discussion also this morning. It's a question of pre-financing on the one side. It's a question on the other side, how to increase the fees to have a return or how long can you accept to have a, a lower return but how to, to grow in. And then you are immediately on the topics that you need somewhere dual to. Because if you would be just on a single till and you have a four billion uh, growth project in front of you which is not financed and where you grow in over the time, you could not afford this to do this as an airport operator if most airport operators I know in Europe are not earning the WEC. They have a WEC, but they are not earning the WEC. Then you don't have the risk potential you need to, to finance and uh, to, to um, realize those projects. So it's a pre-finance issue which is not solved, even in Europe up to now, even not in, in Germany. And it's in addition a question on dual till single till because you need a strength to develop those projects. The question was on the table <clears throat> whether there is an optimum investment level. Um, sorry to go ahead. Yes, there is an optimum investment level, but I think you cannot give a, a simple number to this. The optimum investment level uh, uh, has a lot of determinants uh, like capacity increase, performance, airline requirements, airline demands, regulatory framework, so operational excellence. Um, and at the end, all is coming together on the question airport charges, return on investment, on capital employed, but also on benchmark. And of course, on the one side, we have the regulation, but on the other side, we have the market competitiveness, and we have to be competitive. So taking the discussions we had this morning, it's not just on the size of airport charges, it's right. If you take more the public interest, it's also on the structural question on airport charges. So a peak pricing, as uh, discussed by Professor Nima this morning, I would say yes. But it's too simple to say just a peak pricing because we have to look, and we discussed it also with Lufthansa somewhere, you have to look, of course, uh, on, on the one side, on the intercontinental traffic, you have to look on the other side, on the transfer uh, passengers, because you need, as a hub, of course, also transfer flights. And you have flights where you can 
issue a peak price. And other flights, probably it's very, very difficult, small and narrow body flights, to issue a peak pricing on, uh, despite on non-intercon flights. Another topic, if you have really a public interest to fulfill and you have a, a congested airport, of course it makes sense to make small aircrafts more expensive, overproportionally expensive, um, which would be a good approach. With the cost plus regulation we have at the moment, not just from the cargo point of view, but also how courts are interpreting those cost plus regulation, you are not able to do this because you have to show that it's really cost-related, also on detail cost-related. So it's not just a passenger fee, not just a landing fee. You have also to show that the costs are related to the passenger fee box at the end, that the landing fees are related to the, to the ground investment somewhere. And then you come, of course, to the main principles, transparency, non-discriminatory, and so on. And then you are immediately at the point that you are not allowed to make smaller aircrafts too much expensive or too expensive compared to white bodies. So there I would uh, totally agree to another regime which is uh, in, in simple terms very easy to say yes we have a competition level and we have to, to be sure that uh, we are in that competition, that benchmark because otherwise nobody is flying. Whatever I have as a regulation. But the regulation is getting more and more um, not uh, to a point of abuse of market power, it's more and more uh, giving us somewhere, compared to the market power of the, the big airline groups, a chance and a long-term view that we can, can do those uh, uh, long-term investments in big expansion programs and so on. So we need somewhere also a protection from that side because from the market power, the airlines uh, give us already a lot of uh, topics to do and a lot of cost savings we, we would have to get through. And you'll see this on the, on the next slide, cost of capital. WAC, yes, it's the right prin principle, that's not a question. And I think we can also agree that the WAC in principle is okay. We then have some discussions, of course, in our round, what is the right level of WAC? Is it, uh, we, we are forced to have a 9.5% pre-tax, which is lower than most of the airlines, of course, 9.5% pre-tax. And I would even agree if we say it's a 7% pre-tax, but we cannot. Why? Because we have uh, standards of accounting and our auditors clearly tell us, no, no, the level with your risk you have is 9.5%, taking a benchmark on energies, on uh, telecom operators, on other airports and so on, and we are not willing to go beyond this, otherwise you have immediately an impairment topic on your books. So it's not so easy uh, how to do this there, but I think that's not really the, the topic of the discussion because I don't know more or less none airport in, in Europe who is really achieving this WAC level. Most of us are on 3%, 4%, 5%, 6% somewhere where you better can shift your money to a saving account but not to an airport. And we need the money from our shareholders because otherwise we cannot finance those uh, extension programs. So summing up the whole thing, um, Yes, I would totally agree with the discussion we had this morning. It's fine if we say we don't need any regulation, but then we need to have the right uh, of ownership of the slots. Then we have to have the right uh, to price directly the end customer, or at least to price peak prices and so on and so on. If there is no uh, acceptance on this, and I don't see any, any public uh, acceptance on this, then we need a uh, regulation. We probably need something like uh, a cost plus, a WAC based regulation uh, with a consultation as we have it at the moment. Um, because otherwise, we have no incentive, and that was discussed this morning. We have no incentive to, to set up uh, additional uh, infrastructure. But I think we should do it a little bit more on a general topic and not so much detailed. Um, to abuse from market power on the one side, but also on the other side to give enough incentive. Um, to set up this additional infrastructure and to give some incentives that we can use the uh, infrastructure we have set up more in the public interest that uh, for an airport like Frankfurt we don't have uh, too much, let's say, uh, connections, connectivity to small cities but more to fulfill our function as an intercont hub and then you need some freedom how to do this and not to be too much regulated on a cost plus based on detail. Thanks.
Thank you very much. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, Mr. Normand uh, Boivin, Vice President of Airport Operations at Montreal's Trudeau International Airport. Uh, over to you, sir. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. First, I thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. Uh, for a, a quick word about the organization of uh, Aéroport de Montréal, or ADM, uh, ADM is respon responsible for the management, the operation, and development of Montreal to air international airports, Pierre Yacht Trudeau and Mirabel. Uh, Montreal Trudeau is located about uh, 20 minutes from the heart of Montreal and has been a world class uh, gateway for North America and Europe for uh, more than uh, 60 years now. And Montreal Mirabel was uh, built in uh, 1975 basically for the Olympics and is now developed as an air all cargo and uh, industrial airport. Uh, ADM per se was created in, 19, uh, in the 19, uh, early 1990s uh, when uh, the Canadian government began transferring airport to local airport authority to deal with the major deficit at the time. Today, a total of 26 airports across the country who are uh, operating under a long-term lease from Transport Canada as part of the national airport system. The um, Canadian airport model, we refer to this as the Canadian model. Under, under, under this model, uh, Transport Canada retains ownership of operating of airport infra infrastructure and ensure lease compliances. Uh, but this is not responsible for uh, operate. Um, but transport is not responsible for operation or infrastructure development. It continues to act as the uh, industry regulators and is responsible for strategic development, strategic areas such as uh, safety, for instance. Uh, airport authorities in Canada, such as ADM, are not-for-profit uh, not for profit financial independent companies. That's uh, probably the uh, most distinctive thing we have with uh, other airports in the, in, 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 in the world. We receive uh, no government grants or subsidies. Quite the opposite, we have to pay, or we have the pleasure to pay Transport Canada to rent our infrastructure, as well as we uh, pay our share of municipal tax, which is uh, kind of a burden in addition to assuming all the risk that we have to uh, operate the airport. Uh, last year, we paid uh, 55 million in tax and rent to uh, both government, municipal, and the Transport Canada, so uh, it's 15% of our total revenue. Uh, when it comes to um, limitation to investment for carriers, this has a big impact on our operation. Uh, on the other hand, we have the freedom to operate and develop our, our own airport as we deem appropriate, and we do not rely on any government for fundings. In fact, we are just like any business. We manage with a view to, save, to satisfy our customers' needs, especially in Montreal being such a uh, small player in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Europe. Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot about this one. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, There we are. Um, Montreal being a small player among the North and East, uh, North American airports, uh, we need to make sure that our customers, the carriers, and the uh, people in Montreal are properly served. Um, overall, the Canadian model has proven very successful. Uh, Canada airport, Canada's airport have invested more than 9.5 billion in infrastructure improvement uh, over the past decades, ensuring that Canada's aviation system has the capacity to need uh, it needs to meet the growth in the few in the years to come. At ADM, we've invested about 1.5 million in uh, uh, to in, in in the in the upgrading of the Montreal Trudeau. Uh, we also become the world leader in leading edge technology such as self service check in, self tagging, mobile check in, and baggage sorting system. Montreal Mirabel for um, airport into our cargo industry, worth noting that there's a Bombardier assembles in regional jets at the uh, NDC series will be developed and assembled there as well. Source of funding. Um, as mentioned, ADM is fully responsible for financing all the capital investment program. Generally speaking, any excess of revenue over expenses is fully reinvested in, in improving our uh, airport infrastructures. Currently, about 35% of, uh, of our revenue comes from aeronautical activities and 29% uh, comes from airport improvement fees. 
a total of 36% is derived from non-aerodical activities, from commercial activities, basically. Uh, the $20 airport improvement fee uh, uh, of a or AIF is levied on the airline's, airplane, airline's ticket for each departing passenger to fund the capital program. However, over the last 10 years, the cumulative capital expenditures have significantly exceeded the funds raised through the AIF. To be precise, more their, um, uh, to be to be precise, since their introduction in 1997, AIF has generated about 700 million, while our investment total 1.7 billion. The difference uh, is is quite ex is uh, of a billion needs to be financed somehow. So the creative uh, creative financing, as most of uh, or, or any of the business, we face the constant challenge of finding new and uh, creative ways to uh, raise funds for our continued program. We currently have 1.3 billion in outstanding bonds. We also have innovated, innovated in the area of third party financing for certain infrastructure development. For example, we built a new de-icing facility 10 years ago uh, with fund raised by the center, center's uh, third party operators through a bond market. Essentially, that means a third party has, has financed ADM's assets without any guarantee from ADM. More recently, we have spun off our baggage room sorting system in the same manner as to third party operators. I'm proud to say that this formula has proven to be very success, to be a big success in our airlines partner and our appreciatives. In terms of airline charges, um, as far as the uh, charges are concerned, it must be noted that ADM does not yet fully recover its aeronautical cost. Uh, we, uh, we worked with a formula that was uh, in existence with Transport Canada at the time, and uh, we've worked it out over the years. Now we, uh, we have a, uh, some kind of an under understanding with the carriers right now to uh, recuperate those costs. Basically, the airlines have asked us over the years to go to a full cost recovery basis because the formula was so unprecise as what the, they were paying for. Then um, when we came up with the numbers, we've looked at the, uh, the, the, uh, our, our aeronautical, aeronautical uh, cost and we realized, or we as a community realized that it wasn't, uh, we weren't recuperating those costs. So we worked a formula by which over the next uh, eight years we'll gain to that, we'll, we'll get to that uh, full cost recovery basis from the airlines. Um, the, um, yeah, basically. Summarize the financing of air for airport infrastructure is constantly challenging, a challenge and requires an innovative and, 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 and active approach. Airport charges will never be sufficient for to um, finance development project and airport needs to look at wide range of alternatives to meet their needs. It is imperative to hold regular, regular consultation with airlines, airport operation, government, and the community on all capital investment program to ensure they are relevant, financially sound, and supported by the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next on the program will be Dominic Schuster. Uh, recently of Sydney Airports. Um, Mr. Schuster, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to have been invited to speak to you this afternoon to help provide an airport perspective on investment in gateway airport infrastructure. In doing so, I'll, I'll draw on the experience in pricing, investment and regulation at Australia's international gateway and largest airport, Sydney Airport. The Australian government privatised the majority of its airports in the late 1990s. Sydney Airport was the last major sale, completed in 2002. Privatisation of the Sydney Airport coincided with the implementation by the Australian government of a probationary period of price monitoring, referred to as light-handed regulation. Uh, there's been a fair bit of talk so far today uh, about whether or not to regulate airports. I'd like to sort of point out that the light-handed regulation isn't a choice of whether or not to regulate. Uh, it's certainly not seen as, as deregulation, but an alternative regulatory model. The introduction of the light-handed regime was largely based on the view that the ability of airports to use market power in their dealings with airlines would be constrained by the threat of a return to formal price regulation. 
the incentive to grow passenger numbers, and hence aeronautical and non-aeronautical revenue, and airline countervailing power. <coughs> uh, a number of views have been expressed about the, about the application of those three incentive structures. But by and large, when the regime was reviewed after its first five-year period, it was considered quite successful. And it's been renewed with some fine tuning to cover the period 2008 to 2013. The government has laid out a set of principles to govern the light-handed regime. Now, notable amongst those is an expectation that airports and airlines will develop commercial relationships, that aeronautical prices should be efficient and deliver adequate returns to airport operators, that the government will intervene if airports exercise their market power, and that airports can adopt different pricing structures such as peak period pricing and efficient price discrimination. Uh, in addition to that, and quite significantly uh, for the light-handed model, is that the Australian Access Regime, uh, referred to as Part 3A of the Trade Practices Act, would apply to airports. This is essentially part of Australia's competition law. <coughs> The National Access Regime exists to promote competition by providing for satisfactory terms of access by third parties to natural monopoly infrastructure. And under this regime, a service can be declared, usually following an application by an access seeker. And after that, the service provider must negotiate with the access seeker uh, on price and other terms of use. Uh, where they fail to conclude terms satisfactorily, then it can be referred to a regulator for an arbitrated outcome. Uh, Sydney Airport, uh, after quite some time negotiating uh, agreements, now has comprehensive commercial agreements in place with all of its major airline customers. And within this commercial framework, Sydney Airport is undertaking a substantial capital investment program, including some half a billion dollars Australian to upgrade the international terminal. The commercial framework has had significant benefits for the airport uh, and its airline customers uh, and passengers. Uh, this includes a streamlined investment process, where the airport operator can work directly with airlines to determine the nature, the timing and the scale of aeronautical investment projects. This leads to faster investment decisions and greater responsiveness to changing market and industry requirements. Arguably, airport operators and their airline customers are better placed to make investment decisions than regulators. The light-handed environment means that well-meaning but often less informed intervention by regulators is not required on project detail as well as on the nature of cost recovery. Of course, disputes can still arrive over investment decisions, particularly where different airlines have differing objectives. Uh, sorry, so uh, disputes can still occur over investment decisions uh, where different objectives. Uh, between different airlines. So airports do need to retain a degree of sovereignty over investment decisions to reflect the common use and nature of airport facilities. However, even within a commercial agreement framework, a number of downsides remain in terms of infrastructure investment. Regularly precedent remains a strong influence on the return that may be generated on aeronautical investment, which means that aeronautical investments remain a less attractive investment prospect than many alternative commercial projects. And this is especially the case where airports face residual regulatory risk on those investments. By their nature, aeronautical investments will entail long recovery periods. Under relatively short-term agreements of, say, five years, airports face the uncertainty of long-lived projects which have to be recovered over multiple ne commercial negotiation periods. So an airport operator needs to weigh up the risk of entering into a very long-term commercial agreement with airlines of, say, 20 years, uh, because market conditions, demand and industry developments are so hard to predict over that time frame. And airlines remain much better placed to redeploy capital and adjust to market change than airports do with their large sunk investments. Uh, I'd also point out there's been a lot of talk so far today as well about introduc introduction of peak period charges and, and varying changes to price structure. Uh, in the interest of, of balance, I think it's fair to point out that that's probably much easier to achieve under a, a regulated environment. The, uh, an environment of commercial negotiation and agreement doesn't really lend itself to substantial changes in price structure uh, because even if you rebalance prices on a revenue neutral basis, say for peak period pricing, some airlines will win and some will lose 
Uh, and so it's actually much easier to get a regulator to implement such a scheme based on its economic merit than it is to commercially agree those sort of changes. In an increasingly competitive environment, airports can no longer afford to make investment decisions in isolation from their ability to attract demand for airport services. The old school regulatory view was that infrastructure investment by monopolies needed to be carefully scrutinised to guard against so-called gold plating because the infrastructure provider had an incentive to overinvest to generate a return on that investment. However, now more than ever, uh, access to capital for investment is constrained and funds invested in a particular aeronautical project are funds that cannot be invested in an alternative project. Uh, these are potentially higher earning non-aeronautical projects. And growth in demand for airport service is not a given. Airport operators must compete in a world context for new airlines, new routes and additional services. And this has become even more apparent with the welcome increase in liberalisation of air rights by many governments around the world. And this is true even for a hub airport, where new generation carriers are, are rationally um, assess and are critical of a whole range of airport combinations based on the forecast yield. And even for so-called legacy carriers, uh, they are increasingly sophisticated about underperforming routes and new destinations and frequencies. And while airport charges still comprise a relatively small component of airline costs and airfares, airports can't be complacent about their impact uh, of charges on airline choice. And poorly targeted or inappropriate investment decisions float through to charges and the impact on an airport's competitiveness. While the light handed regime has created a more favourable investment environment, it's not free from residual regulatory risk, which can influence the confidence an airport has in undertaking capital investment. In the case of Australia, the government has stated it will intervene, potentially through the reintroduction of formal price controls, to address inappropriate pricing behaviour or a misuse of market power. While this is an important check on market power under the light handed regime, airports remain exposed to changes in the criteria used to assess their behaviour and to the manner in which the criteria will be applied. And there's also a risk of changes to the regime uh, at the time of formal review periods and, and even during formal review periods. Uh, and this includes such things as expanding the coverage uh, of the monitoring regime. We've seen items such as car, car parking included recently in the monitoring regime, uh, as well as a range of previously uh, covers items that were previously not covered, such as airline office space in the terminal. Uh, and this type of, of regulatory bracket creep uh, increases the scope of potentially regulated services. Uh, there also may be instances where, while an airport generally operates under a commercial agreement environment, the government may consider it necessary to regulate specific services with formal price regulation. And this presents the risk to the airport operator that, that regulatory decisions on a small number of their services will be quite influential in the type of outcomes that can be negotiated commercially for the rest of its services. And the risk of intervention through alternative avenues of regulation also remains. The most apparent mechanism for this in the Australian context is through the national access regime. The stated role of the access regime as part of the light-handed environment uh, was to provide airlines with regulation of last resort, to address intractable disputes and to prevent effective denial of access through the terms of use of airport services. However, recent judicial decisions on the application of the access regime have lowered the hurdle for declaration of a service and they allow the regime to be used as a de facto form of price regulation. The regime can be used by airlines to increase commercial leverage with the potential to seek regulatory arbitration likely to change the overall dynamics of commercial negotiations. All negotiations involve a degree of give and take and compromises will be made in reaching an overall agreement. The access regime leaves open the risk that airlines may choose to cherry pick certain terms such that the, they can retain the more favourable terms from the agreement uh, and then subject the less favourable terms to uh, access arbitration by a third party. Dominic, you, are you coming to the end pretty soon? I am at the end. Thank you. So just in summary, the advantages of a light hand regime are uh, listed here. I've pretty much been through those, so I can draw to an end on that. Uh, thanks so much. <clears throat>
and we can congratulate him because he's only been president since January of this year. Uh, so welcome, congratulations, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Jeff. Um, well, a few opening remarks. Uh, first of all, I thought that I had three quarters of an hour to present to you how great airport Amsterdam Airport is. Uh, and this morning I found out that I have to squeeze it in 10 minutes, but I will do my best. Um, a second uh, general statement is that we at Schiphol Airport, we really love our regulators. And, uh, and we, we try to hack them every day. And, uh, but sometimes uh, a, a little voice in my head says, but why so many? I will come back on that a bit later. Uh, we also hack on a daily basis all our customers being airlines, uh, being our passengers, uh, whereby airlines we see as our customers, but hopefully also as our partners in business. Uh, so that are a few opening remarks. On this sheet, which is hardly, hardly readable, uh, well, it, it shows how great an airport uh, Schiphol really is. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud to be in this role of CEO of such an, uh, such an impressive airport. And, uh, and I can be really passionate about it, but, but I, then I need my three quarters of an hour, so I will keep it short. Uh, basically, we did our investments in infrastructure. And, uh, and that's one of the beauties, that uh, we uh, developed infrastructure uh, slightly ahead of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the development of demand. So we have plenty of runways, and uh, so we don't have to build in uh, these uh, very weird times, new runways, and uh, Stefan, I, I would think twice before doing that, and uh, it's such a huge investment. Um, our nominal capacity is currently 110 air traffic movements per, uh, at a peak moment, and we will increase that over a couple of years' time to 120. Uh, 428,000 air traffic movements per, per year, that was 2008. And we have an, uh, a very uh, 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 remarkable agreement with the environment and with the, being the environment being people living around the airport. And in the Netherlands, that means all the Dutch uh, citizens. Uh, we have uh, counseled with them, we have consulted with them what the, uh, what the growth potential of Schiphol Airport should be. And through this process, which took uh, about two, two and a half years, uh, where, by the way, airlines were, of course, represented as well, and uh, so our political parties were represented, resulted in an agreement that we are able to grow to 580,000 traffic movements, air traffic movements, of which, however, 70,000 should be at uh, two of our regional airports. And that is defined as selective growth. Uh, I am I'm happy that we have concluded this. Uh, the infrastructure is sufficient, uh, being the big infrastructure works, runaways, runways and the like, to facilitate this growth. And certainly with uh, current numbers in, uh, in our minds, this, this will be sufficient. After 2020, we will have sufficient room to grow further. This is our strategy. And it, it fits on one page. And it is built on two pillars, one being what we call the socio-economic function. And, and here, Schiphol Airport might be an, uh, an, uh, have, have a different role than other airports. Might be, I'm a bit careful with that statement, but uh, Schiphol is absolutely crucial for the economic development of the Netherlands. And uh, without Schiphol, Amsterdam would not be Amsterdam, it would be a village. And, uh, and can you imagine what, 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 what you all would miss if Schiphol would not be there? And so we see this as our most important role. And a number of the other points I will skip, but sustainability, our uh, corporate social responsibility, sustainability, uh, taking care of the environment, are integral elements of this uh, strategy. On the right side, however, we have the, the element of what we call an entrepreneurial management means that we have to be a lean and mean organization, uh, we have to be financially robust, uh, we have to focus on uh, short-term cost reductions, of course, 
and on the, long, on the longer term, our cost per workload unit should go down. And what we said, and that's very important for, uh, for the airlines to notice, is that due to the recession, and, and that's, well, actually, it's the first time that, uh, that we use this word, recession, this morning, but uh, as probably some of you might know, that we are uh, experiencing the heaviest recession ever, and, uh, and we believe as an airport we have to react on that, and we do that because our socio-economic function is, uh, is getting harmed through this recession. Uh, and also because the government thought that it would be a nice idea to introduce a ticket tax on the 1st of July 2008, which, by the way, has been abolished, uh, so it's also good news, and uh, which is an, an unicum because normally governments don't abolish taxes, they introduce no, new taxes, but we were able to abolish the tax within a year after introduction. Um, well done for the total aviation industry, by the way. But because our socio-economic function is, uh, is getting harmed, we said that from the right side, the entrepreneurial management, we have to uh, play the instrument of aviation charges by accepting a significant lower uh, return on our, uh, on our aviation activities. And uh, meaning that for 2009 and 2010, we will be loss making for aviation uh, before deduction, even before deduction of capital cost. Um, the, uh, well, what is Schiphol Group on this sheet? On the left, aviation, that's the, the, the blue part. Uh, 600 million of revenues, including security, of which operating result of 2008 of 50 million. That's before deduction of capital cost, and uh, 2009, substantial lower, I said earlier. And the profit we really make in our consumer business, that's a retail business, and real estate, and uh, some participations we have. Uh, we have a dual till regulation mechanism, and I'm very pleased that uh, Mr. Niemeyer uh, sees that as an ideal uh, regulatory system. I must say that I, uh, that, I, that I don't support all the observations Mr. Niemeyer made in his paper, um, and, uh, but, but I, it's good that I read the paper after preparing my introduction. But, uh, but I'm very happy to say that practice and theory are not always the same. Um, we, uh, well, dual till, I don't think I have to explain now what dual till means. We have a procedure, procedural framework which means that we have four weeks of consultation with the airlines uh, and, and then the airlines have a five-month uh, period during which they, uh, they can request a review by an independent regulator. Uh, it's a bit of a long period. Uh, it's a heavy debate, of course, but through that, through this system, we uh, debate with our, uh, with our partners in business, our airlines, others, what we think our cost base should be and what we think our investment base should be. Uh, but once again, we take a measure, and that's on the, on the right uh, lower end of this page, Schiphol Group, to use aviation charges as instruments as an instrument to improve our competitive position by just lowering our rates. This is a shareholder structure. Uh, we are uh, principally state-owned. Uh, municipality of Amsterdam has a big stake, and uh, since, uh, since half a year's time, we have Aeroport de Paris uh, with an 8% stake in our business, and we have an 8% stake in, uh, in their business. Uh, well, selective investments and continued cost control. Uh, what I said earlier, our runway and terminal infrastructure is basically in place. Of course, we have to expand and we have to keep on investing, but uh, that are a relative modest amount if I compare it with some of our competitors. Um, we still have to keep on making investments in, uh, in improving our quality and improving our sustainability of the airport, uh, but that's also uh, quite uh, obvious, of course. Um, and we have a continued focus on lowering over our overall visit cost, where the idea is uh, is not focused on that much on well on visit cost being the charges you are paying to the airport, but more at uh, the visit cost the total chain is paying. For instance, at Schiphol Airport, we have already for decades 
uh, the fact that uh, ground handling is done by seven competitors and as a result of that uh, we have su sufficiently competition to ensure that prices are, uh, are, are low. Um, internally we are planning to, to reduce our headcount. Uh, our headcount currently is roughly two and a half thousand uh, for the total group and we will reduce it to an, uh, to an 1800. I expect tomorrow an, uh, an agreement with the unions and our works council on this figure. Uh, we cannot go lower than that because then we would, uh, then our, our uh, regulators, inspectors, uh, red tape guardians, etc., etc., would have employed more than we would, and that's not possible. Um, the, that's a joke, by the way. Um, the, uh, well, a lot of, of focus on, uh, on, on cost reduction, uh, clear in the times we are uh, currently, uh, currently operating. Uh, challenges and opportunities. Creating green airports. Um, I know that this is not part of the topic of today, but I believe that airports in the world, and certainly airports in Europe, have to be sustainable airports and, uh, and the aviation business has to do whatever they can to become more sustainable and I know that a number of them, a large number of them are doing their utmost best to, uh, to uh, reach those ambitious goals. We at Schiphol, we want to be uh, climate neutral for CO2 by 2012. Uh, competitive cost level, explained that already. Um, Initiatives to limit increases in security and other ex exogenous costs, uh, often caused by new government measures, uh, could be could be reduced, should be reduced. A number of the competitive threats here, but they are all known to you. And uh, yeah, monopoly or monopsony. Uh, at Schiphol Airport, a Sky Team is uh, counting for uh, more than 50% of our traffic. And, uh, and we believe that uh, the only way it works is to build true partnerships with our Sky Team partners because they are, f they are attached to our airport. We are attached to, uh, to Sky Team and, uh, and we see this as a sustainable partner. And that means that uh, all our activities have to be discussed with them up front and afterwards in order to fine tune uh, the things we are doing and uh, with the optimal goal to reduce cost for the total chain. So not reduce cost for uh, air traffic control or reduce cost for the airport, but to reduce cost for the total chain. And at the end, creating win-win situations for airport and airlines. And I'm, I'm using, and I'm mentioning Sky Team, but it means, Tim, that uh, of course uh, it's not limited to, uh, to Sky Team only, that. but to all airlines. I'm not coming for a hug. <laughs> Uh, Jeff, that's uh, in a nutshell my, uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jos. All right, well, we're going to, we'll open it up now, but uh, before we open it up, I think it's only fair that I introduce, even though we won't hear from them uh, until the third session, uh, uh, we won't hear their opening statements until the third session. I hope we'll hear from them in this session. However, in response to some of the things that we've heard from our airport representatives, let me introduce uh, our airline representatives, and I'll start at the far end, Carl, Ru Carl Rudolf Ruprecht, uh, Deutsche Lufthansa, uh, an investor in and a partner of Fraport, as we, as we heard from Stefan Schulte. Uh, next, Tim Clark, the president of Emirates Airlines, chairman of the Emirates Airline Foundation, Welcome, Tim. Uh, Dr. Kandan Karlitikin, the uh, chairman of the board uh, of Turkish Airlines. Welcome to you, sir. And David Ham, uh, a member of Sky Team, uh, as the uh, director of corporate real, uh, real estate at Delta Airlines. Um, I think we have a very interesting group before you, and I think we can have a very interesting discussion of some of the points that you've heard, uh, particularly uh, reactions from, from the airlines themselves. I, I wanted to start the discussion simply by talking about this concept of partnership because we've heard it from Frankfurt, we've heard it from Amsterdam. Uh, when there is a special relationship, if you will, between a major hub airport and a major hubbing airline at that airport, what are the consequences overall for, for competition? And I, I'd be grateful to hear first from both uh, Jos and from Stefan, 
uh, and then from their partners uh, who are sitting on the other side of the table, and perhaps from Emirates and uh, Turkish to hear what, what the consequences from their perspective might be. Because it's an interesting concept. One, one is attracted to the idea that there should be a partnership between airlines and airports. I wonder how it works in practice, particularly for the non-partners. Please. Jeff, thanks. Um, it's the same with Amsterdam. If you have a main airline and a main airline group um, making up more than 60% of your traffic, then you have, of course, the interest um, to work together. That's quite clear. But also in the interest of the passenger, because the passenger is not differentiated between airline and airport. He is seeing the whole topic as one product. And the product means arriving in the air, having the ground process, and uh, departure, departuring in the air. So the total product has to be the best one if you want to be positioned as a premium player. Um, so you have to, to work together um, on all the different processes from check-in, security, up to gate positioning, um, uh, ground handling, and all these topics. And it's so much linked that you really can only solve those topics if you work together. That's the one thing. On the other thing, on the other side, as an airport operator, you have to make sure that you have 40% additional carriers, which are also very important, because that gives a total sense of, of connectivity we have, and we have to, to make sure that we treat all airlines, of course, equally. That means, on the one side, yes, we have intensive rounds, together with the main carrier, no question, to define what's the way, what are your requirements regarding um, investments five years, ten years from now. But we also have to make sure that we discuss together with Emirates, together with other airlines, what are their requirements for their parts of the airport, their terminal facilities and so on. And we, of course, have to make sure at the end that we allocate the terminal facilities, the infrastructure in the most efficient way because otherwise we have inefficiencies which have to be paid. Um, I think in principle the system partnership is working in a quite well way. We have uh, achieved uh, good results over the last years, especially on the operational side. If you come then to the question of um, charging, regulation, it's quite obvious that there is um, some conflict of interest, which I can understand from both points of view. They have to make sure that they have uh, uh, let's not say most cheap operations, that's probably also not the right way, but uh, most efficient operations and that uh, are not charged too high because uh, they are on the end market with the passenger, they, they are under big pressure on the ticket prices. And airlines on the other side also understand or have to understand, I think they understand, that we also can only invest if we have return. And we have two different boxes, very simple. And we only get the money to invest for the next generation um, and slots are the most important things for all of us in the industry, otherwise we cannot grow if we get the money from the shareholders. That means we need a return, but we need also some incentives to be cost efficient, that's clear, and we have this pressure, not just from the main customer, the main customer is also making more pressure, that's normal, but also from the other airline group, because at the end we have two, three, four main airline groups who, who make the pressure uh, on, on such an airport, and, you can discuss whether we are on a competitive level, as, uh, uh, whether we are on, under comp uh, competition, yes. If you take a Frankfurt airport, it's a hub. We have a regional monopoly, that's right. But if you take uh, our figures, we are more than 50 million passengers, we would be, I don't understand in the wrong way, we would be back to a regional airport like Hamburg, Düsseldorf, or what even, because Frankfurt would be nothing. It's like Amsterdam, Frankfurt would be nothing without such an airport. We would have to, to fire a lot of people, we would have a lot of uh, scale investments. Um, so with the hub traffic, we are really under competition. And that's the interesting thing there. Um, um, how, to, to fit to, how to come to the right regulation being on the other side in the competition field there. And Emirates can fly tomorrow to Frankfurt, they can fly to the day after to, to, to Paris if they, if they are not happy with the service, if we are too expensive and so on. It's a little bit more difficult for a home carrier, but the home carrier also set up some competition with Munich, uh, with Zurich and so on. So I think we are quite well under the way and we know what competition means. 
just a few just a few other additional comments. Uh, the uh, also at Schiphol, but Stefan said it as well, and I think that Schiphol and Frankfurt are not that different in this uh, this respect. Uh, you have a stable partner. We have a stable partner, being Sky Team. At the same time, we need all the other carriers as well in order to build this uh, the 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 the. Uh, the network of connections uh, which you want to facilitate from an, uh, from a an hub airport. Uh, so you need both. Uh, the beauty of a large partner is that you can easily discuss with them what, uh, what, what, what certain measures mean uh, for the total cost structure. Uh, at the same time, as an airport, you have the responsibility to look at what it means for the other airports and that you are not uh, putting uh, too much benefits to uh, to the uh, well in our case the Sky Team uh, Alliance. Um, very important for uh, for further competition and allowing further competition. However, is uh, perhaps the slot allocation system, which has been discussed in the paper of uh, of Mr. Niemeyer as well, uh, because that uh, makes uh, uh, more competition a bit difficult. Uh, especially if you want to have more competition in the peak period, because the peaks are already uh, are already forgiven, and uh, and liberalisation or true open skies are also not yet uh, as they uh, as they should be. Uh, that are a few comments in addition to what uh, what Stefan said. Thanks very much. Uh, I wonder if we could hear from Lufthansa about the uh, relationship with Frankfurt and how how it looks from your perspective and uh, what what does your competition. Uh, think of it. We'll hear from the competition too, I can assure you, but I'd be interested in, in knowing what your view is. Yeah, first of all, I can agree to what Stefan and uh, Jos already said. I think the most benefit is for the customer. The customer normally can't um, distinguish between products which we deliver and what is done by the airport. So from that point of view, best operation is one benefit for the customer. Second is that we can use our market intelligence to find out the best way to grow. And the third way is, uh, as you mentioned already, to convince our neighborhoods that growing can be managed. What can we do by active noise control and set up repair? So from that point of view, I think there's a wide range of activities where we can um, work together and integrate our partnership. Of course, on the cost side, we have a lot of issues to clarify. That is also where we have to work on it. And uh, of course, uh, we are in a situation that we on our side look for opportunities to use competition by using different hubs. And of course, uh, the airport has uh, the knowledge from, from an experience from other airlines as well. So I think that's um, um, the way how partnership can work. And um, especially for established uh, airports, it's uh, the only way where we can manage crew in Europe. Thanks. Uh, David? Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree. I mean, partnership is key in the process of growing airports. I mean, at the end of the day, for us, economic development for the region is what's clearly important. And I loved your point about it being a village without the airport. Most cities would be similarly such. It's the airport that drives economic development. Um, major um, hubbing carriers with relationships with their local airports are what enables that by making sure the, the growth of the airport and the cost of that airport are timed correctly for when the carriers are really ready to expand. Um, if you overbuild capacity early on, the cost structure gets to a point where it's unaffordable and, you know, we have market power in the sense that we can choose to fly to an airport, but the reality is if I want to fly to Amsterdam, there's only one airport. Right? I mean, if I want to fly to Frankfurt, you, you don't have choices if you're going to serve certain markets. So there has to be that relationship. And we clearly appreciate those airports that come to the table in partnership with the carriers to make sure that, that the growth is appropriate. Um, and, and we think it can support both the hubbing carriers and the smaller carriers in any given market. You, you know, if you're charging them equitably, um, everybody can have a fair and balanced trade, tr trading field and, and playing field and, and implement th that growth similarly. So. Um, definitely appreciate the partnership approach. Tim Clark, uh, you fly out of a, uh, a hub called Dubai, which the head of Luft Lufthansa's alliance uh, referred to just recently in some remarks as an artificial hub in the desert. Uh, what is your reaction when you come to one of these genuine hubs? 
uh, <laughs> to the partnerships that we've been uh, describing. Okay, well, um, Jeff, uh, I think I'll leave that till this afternoon, if you don't mind. And I, what I'd just like to um, remark on is the, on the face of it, um, the relationship that an airport operator has with its client base. De facto, if there is an anchor tenant that sits on top of the hub, then uh, the relationship that that operator will have with that tenant is likely to shape the way the operator goes about its business, notwithstanding the requirements of the other community. And that's on the face of it, and I, I think that's, that's fair comment. Uh, we have found as we grow in our business that uh, the, the interaction we have with the airport authorities has generally been a good one, irrespective of the uh, arrangements that they may have had on a commercial basis or whether they may be uh, government-owned um, or having a stake in a, in a government airline. Where it becomes more incestuous, I, I guess, is that the, uh, the overriding um, commercial... Um, requirements of the dominant player in the hub when merged with other carriers in an alliance could be detrimental to the carriers that are entering those hubs or those systems uh, which are trying to make their way and it's very important that the airport operator and I would get on to that this afternoon with regard to where the regulator comes in in a global context uh, that the airport, airport operator sees the way forward in terms of a level playing field. And that the, the services and benefits that it provides for its non-hub, um, call it what, consolidated group alliance, if you like, are equal to and are not seen to be in any way marginalized by the activities of the dominant players. For Emirates, uh, we go where the market is, obviously we do. And as David just said, Frankfurt is a, is a, a very powerful market. We're not into Amsterdam yet, but I'm coming for that hug. Um, but uh, it's Schiphol. But um, the, the, it, we will look at the treatment we get and the services that are provided for the, for the nature of the business that we do, uh, which is generally a high, uh, high cost, um, full service operation. Those that provide it for us and work with us, and this is so important in terms of the relationships we have with the operators, is critical in the determination whether we go there at all. Uh, I'm not saying that the airport charges are paramount, they're obviously very important, but it's what we do and how we like to interact our ground product, product with our uh, in-flight product which shapes uh, everything else. Now, if we find that the, as I said, if you, if you enter into a relationship, a partnership, um, which compromises our ability to do that job, for reasons best known to the airport operator and its other partners, then we will take a view as to whether we want to go there at all. It's quite simple. But as I said, hitherto, we've never had a situation where operators have made it um, difficult for us because of that. And I, I have to say that um, where there have been those relationships, and we know there are many, uh, generally we found that the operators are incredibly uh, cooperative and are very conscious of the fact that we are aware of that relationship. Thanks. This is turning into a positive love fest. I'm not sure uh, I intended anything like this. Uh, Dr. Karlitikin, uh, what, what is your view of, of operating to a, a Frankfurt or, or a Schiphol or even a Montreal where Air Canada, I suppose, stands uh, in, a, in a special relationship with the operator? Well, uh, as long as we don't have two hats, I see no problems because if you uh, use an uh, airport and if you also have some other relations in the form of uh, like partnership uh, in a corporational sense, that may uh, theoretically pose some problems. But uh, of course, uh, in the case of Frankfurt, uh, we have to look at the implementation in the field. So far, we didn't, we didn't see any problem. Uh, which may, but potentially that uh, that's a uh, I see as a problem. However, uh, in other cases where there are no such relations, are we uh, you know free from all these uh, problems with, which may come out of these special relations? And uh, if we say uh, okay, the the airlines uh, alliances uh, may be posing some threat to non-aligned uh, airlines. And by having this dominance in certain hubs, 
uh, but uh, you know, again, I have to look at to, to, to the field and uh, the the implementation of these, all these commercial pa policies and practices. I see that uh, in, in in practice, really, uh, we have uh, good competition, even though the dominance is there in big hubs. Uh, you know, we have globally, we have a free flow of information. Customers are not uh, stupid. They listen to, they they experience, they uh, you know look at the, the prices, and the, they have a value about the the, the airline uh, airline service and uh, the whole package. And uh, we don't need uh, to really worry about too much about these special relations. Whereas uh, in some other cases, uh, if the uh, the the owner of the airport and the owner of the airline uh, is the same. Uh, with, with the different uh, entities, of course, uh, commercial or non-commercial entities, that potentially may pose also a problem uh, for others. But again, there I see no problem uh, at all because uh, I'm flying to all these different destinations. We are in Star Alliance. Uh, we don't see a favorable uh, treatment uh, in, in Fraport. Uh, you know, or we don't see any unfavorable treatment in Singapore or in Dubai. And in Turkey, for example, uh, like in 2003, there was the opportunity for us as Turkish Airlines to acquire Sabiha Gökçen Airport, which is on the Asian side of Istanbul. And that time, that airport, all the you know, cows were uh, you know, getting their inputs for milk production uh, around the runway. So that, that day, they were losing a lot of money every year, and they, uh, they spent about some, I don't know, 600 million dollars to have this airport, but they were you know, losing money to maintain uh, this airport. And uh, I was offered uh, that airport about uh, 250 million dollars, uh, the, the total assets. But that time, we were uh, owned by the state 98%. And we didn't have this flexibility. But even if I had the flexibility, it was not a proper move. And uh, what we did, we just entered into it. Uh, we developed the, uh, the airport. Actually, it's not the fixed assets which makes an airport. It is the, it's the operators, the airliners, the people who really invest in there. I spent uh, like at least $25 million, uh, million dollars loss for uh, successive three years to have this to uplift this uh, airport in Sabiha Gökçen. And after three years, as we uh, made this investment and created a traffic over there, and then uh, we uh, saw all these other airlines uh, followed. So uh, partnerships, uh, I mean, it, I, I cannot categorize one way or the other of any model, anything, but rather uh, we have to see what, what is happening in, in the playing field if really it's, it's okay, if there's something wrong, of course, then you will see the issue popping up and we will uh, really fight for it. Thank you. But you're saying that it was, you felt it was in the airline's interest to invest in the airport because the quality of the services at the airport actually reflected on your services. Is that, is that what you're saying? That your customers would be happier if you were operating out of a well, airport. well, I mean, if, if you ask me as an airline, uh, I, I have different views, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, for me, it, it shouldn't be the way. I mean, the airlines should have the hats. They have, they have to concentrate on uh, getting the aircraft, flying people and cargo, and that's it. And the air airports should be completely separate from airlines. I, I noted that uh, Raphael Hiraman in the back uh, asked a question at the end of the last session, which was a pretty good segue into this session. Uh, he was asking about the dual till system and questioning it, frankly, on the, on the ground that uh, those passengers uh, that are buying things in the shops and delivering revenue in that second till are only there because of him or because of the airlines who are attracting passengers. In other words, in effect, he's saying, uh, don't fancy that people are coming to the airport because you have some nice shops. They're coming because of us, the carriers that are, that are supplying the services that they're at the airport to consume. Uh, it's an argument against the, sec the second till. Uh, 
We've heard the economists say that the problem with a single till, however, is that then you start cross-subsidizing, if you will, from the retail non-aviation operations uh, into the airfield operations, and the net result is that the costs are too low, uh, and you end up with congestion, uneconomic pricing, and so forth. So there's a real tension here. Uh, let me just ask, what's your reaction to the suggestion that is the airlines uh, and not the, uh, the shopping mall that has attracted customers to the airport and that therefore there ought to be recognition of that, that revenue on, on behalf of the airlines as opposed to keeping it separate? If I may start, Jeff. Uh, yeah, it's a good point. First, um, passengers are not there because just of the airline. If there would be no airport, there would be no passengers. Very simple. <laughs> Second, um, I have never heard any discussion that uh, ticket prices of airlines should be reduced by the profits out of technical facility management and so on of the airlines, of the business units. So, but coming back to that point, then, a little bit more serious maybe. I think I gave you already some information beforehand uh, why we need a dual till system. Um, most of the airports are not earning their capital costs on the regulated aviation side, first point. Second point, we have no pre-financing agreement up to now. We have lead times of up to 10 years. We discuss even with our airlines three, four, five years beforehand where we want to construct something. We have uh, capital employed for two, three years up to the time that a new peer is coming into operation. Um, and all those financings have to be, all those capital investments have to be financed somewhere else on the cost, uh, cost side. They have to be covered. So we need some extra source for this. Um, or otherwise we are somewhere in a model like Montreal discussed this, um, that whatever the costs are, whatever the profits are, it's given back to the airlines. But then we are in something like a 100% public model that we are not. We are in a model that we have private shareholders uh, that we are able to take risk on a five years contract, for example, a third, year, a, a third argument. If you want to do a, a midterm contract, and I'm, we are ready to do this, if you want to do a midterm contract, you have to have the power to take risk, but you also have to have chances, of course. Um, another example, we discussed this on Amsterdam, it's the same for Frankfurt. We are developing more and more to an airport city. Who is paying for this? An airport city, you can only develop if the airport operator is somewhere a core, a core person in this. Um, because you have the context, you have the power, you have the, the feeling what's good for the airport, you can develop this. But you have pre-financing on this. If you are just on a single till base, um, there's no chance to develop those issues or you need a much higher WAC. Uh, to have, uh, so I'm able to, to discuss this point. Do we go from, let's say, historical purchase prices to to economic value, repurchase value on a single base, a single, uh, single, term, a single till base. Yes, and probably you have such a lot of reserves somewhere in your accounts that you have this money for, for the next generation of uh, next moder modernization, next generation of investments. But as long as we are like Germany on a historical cost based regulation, then we need to do it till because otherwise we cannot develop those things which are also in favor for the airlines, not just for the airports. And we also should have some incentive to develop those areas because we know from the customer surveys that passengers are more and more telling us the journey is starting on the airport not on the final destination. We want to have more and more interesting um, shops, areas, uh, restaurants, and so on. We want to have more, yeah, more pleasure at the end. Uh, we want to have a, a feel-good atmosphere, and we're also reducing costs for the airlines there, even in the dual tilt system, because those areas are going out of the dual tilt. They are in the second tilt and not any longer in the regulated tilt. So terminal facilities are used more efficient. I think it's a good model. Thanks. I wanted to ask Dominic, who has uh, transitioned from a publicly owned uh, model to a, a privatized model at, at Sydney, what the impressions you have are of the, of the change in incentives, the, the, the change in uh, what, what, what changes 
in, in your operation at Sydney, the transition to privatization brought about, particularly from the perspective of your, of your primary customers, the airlines? The, uh, the largest change, I think, would be taking on a more, a more rational view about investment in infrastructure on the airport, the, the recognition of uh, the relative scarcity of funds and uh, in investing the dollars in the most wise way that you can. Uh, and in addition, uh, I think we have developed an increased customer focus. Uh, certainly throughout my period of time at the airport, the way we've dealt with and interacted with our airline customers has uh, never been better. Uh, to, to go from a, a uh, essentially a regulated model where th there were clear demarcations of interest between airlines and the airport to move through a relatively difficult negotiation period uh, to be in a position where, where agreements could actually be signed by both parties, I think, with, with a dramatic change in the relationship. Uh, and that has seen uh, just a far more favourable environment for doing business on the airport. Thanks, Dominic. I, I wanted to ask each of each of our airport representatives uh, to just give a moment's thought to if if you could change one thing about the regulatory structure in which you operate, what would it be? There'd be fewer regulators, I suppose, in the case of Amsterdam, right? Uh, but, but seriously, uh, if you if if there are things that you would change in the interest of better service, of, of more investment, of uh, whatever whatever objective you feel is, is being in some way impeded by a, a, a less than optimal regulatory structure, what change would you make? I can start, yes, so it was the first idea. I think I mentioned already, I think in principle the cost plus regulation is not wrong. Mm, to be sure that we are not misuse the, the regional monopole situation you have and uh, the situation that even a major ha home carrier cannot walk away tomorrow. He can walk away over the time, but not tomorrow. But I would like to see it a little bit more flexible. That say, uh, saying what, we, what you discussed in the first panel, and I think it was a comment from UK, it has to be over a range of years, cost-based related, as a general till, let's say it's this way, but on detail, an airport should be more flexible how he sets the charges on detail regarding, for example, peak pricing, uh, especially if you are a congested airport, regarding the question, uh, do you want to attract more small aircrafts, more wide-body aircrafts, regarding the question how you set transfer passenger prices compared to intercon domestic passenger prices, but under the principles of non-discriminatory and transparency, that's clear. But to have a little bit more freedom on that side. You, you would definitely engage in more congestion pricing if, if there were more flexibility, you think? An airport operator has two functions. The main function is the public function for the region, for Germany, for whatever your, your market is. To have the slots available, to have the traffic available, to have a public function there. But to do this on an economic base, most efficient. And this public function, I think we have difficulties at the moment really to allocate slots in the right way. We are not the slot owner, and I'm not going so far because that's unrealistic to ask for being the slot owner. Would be nice, but no chance. Yeah, I, I, as uh, people probably know, I am a recovering regulator myself. And uh, when we were looking at the possibility of creating that greater flexibility uh, at the Department of Transportation in Washington, uh, we, we thought about a number of things, such as in order to stay within this cost-based requirement, actually giving money, you know, taking excess money from the, the peak operator and encouraging operations in the, in the trough at airports, which had periods of time when the, the airport was basically empty. Uh, again, uh, for reasons that Kate Lang spoke about, the statutory framework just 
in the United States is just absolutely unfriendly to that kind of flexibility. So in effect, we, we share this, this constraint. Normand, uh, what would you do if you could uh, change Canadian regulation with the stroke of the pen? Um, I guess from a, uh, I, 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 I would tend to believe, I'll speak to, uh, on behalf of most of the airport in Canada, is the fact that we have the obligation to reinvest our revenues in the airport infrastructure the mere fact of paying a high rent to the government and the obligation to pay the uh, tax, the municipal tax, or the in lieu, the, uh, the PILT, as we call it in Canada, the uh, payment in lieu of taxes, um, derives the investment from helping the aviation business grow in any of the cities in, in, in Canada. So uh, by, with, without any doubt, that, that would be the one thing we would change in Canada. Dominic. And, and please, uh, those of you in the audience, the, the floor will be open as soon as we have a couple of more comments. Uh, I need to bear in mind that we have uh, at Sydney Airport what many would consider to be quite a favourable overall economic regulation environment. Uh, so in terms of what you would change, uh, I'd actually look to the slot control environment at the airport, uh, which, is, uh, which provides movement caps in certain times of the day. Uh, and more particularly protects a, a range of slots for particular interest users at, at peak periods, which is actually a major constraint on unlocking value at the airport, uh, because a, a 34 seat aircraft can effectively hold out um, a, an A380. Uh, so in terms of making the most of the investment, it would be looking to unlock those sorts of slot controls. Do you, uh, do you feel a tension, though, about uh, smaller communities and their access to the to the air transport system. This is the tension we certainly have in the U.S. where if you simply allowed uh, the highest value operations, uh, most passengers on, a, on the largest aircraft paying obviously the largest fee, uh, you would end up closing off access to lots of relatively small rural communities and that, that becomes the regulator's uh, dilemma. I, I agree that you need to have appropriate protection in place to ensure that there's equal access to the airport. The, but the arrangements need to be reviewed periodically to ensure they provide the right incentive to use that properly. So uh, ensuring access to the airport doesn't mean it should be on the smallest aircraft, for example. There's no incentive to uh, more efficiently use the slots that they have. I wouldn't necessarily say they should be taken from them. Yes. Yeah, well, actually, I don't have that much on my wish list from uh, the regulators. Uh, I think we have sufficient room to maneuver. However, what I said earlier and what has been, uh, has been expressed by my colleagues as well, uh, more liberalization, open skies, true open skies, combined with a thorough review of the current slot allocation system uh, might, be, uh, might be a good idea. And... Uh, uh, yeah, and, 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 and about your earlier comment uh, about rural areas and, and what does that mean, I believe that the market should work and, and, it, and it will work. And, uh, and, and, and for instance, uh, well, Schiphol is also the owner of, of Rotterdam Airport. Rotterdam Airport had a particular line with Heathrow and that has been changed or cancelled because that particular slot at Heathrow was too valuable to spend on, uh, on a link with, with Rotterdam Airport, uh, which is understandable. Uh, uh, and it's regretful for, uh, for Rotterdam and the Rot Rotterdam community, but this is the, how the market works. And at the same time, uh, I think that, that we all understand that uh, large aircraft need to be filled with, uh, with feeders of smaller aircraft from uh, those same rural areas. So you need it. And uh, so I believe that market will work automatically there. You're, you're saying the market will work by providing a, a connecting service for the people in Rotterdam that couldn't make the non-stop. They'll go through. They'll go through you. They'll go oh, through Amsterdam. Right? Yeah. Well, uh, the Netherlands is pretty small, so they can go by bike from Rotterdam to Amsterdam <laughs> and, and catch the plane on time. Uh, so th the problem is not that significant. Uh, but but what how it works is that uh, that the Heathrow so the line. Rotterdam Heathrow is cancelled and replaced by Rotterdam Rotterdam City Airport. Right? It, it's it's easily solved in the marketplace. 
Yeah, I, in, in some larger countries, it's, it's been more of a dilemma for us. And I can, I can tell you that the, the market doesn't always work for all communities. Uh, it is possible to simply adopt that view and simply say it's just an expensive proposition to live in a small town. Uh, I can make that argument as well. I'm not making any argument. I'm just noting them that it is a, it, it's tough. Um, any comments or questions from the audience? A hand right there, please. While we're waiting, I just wanted to ask Yos, um, speaking about the, the need for greater liberalization of air services as one contributor, is there a reason, I, I assume that all airport operators would see enormous benefits from more open market arrangements because it just creates the possibility of more service from everywhere and to everywhere. Why then haven't airports as a community been more vocal in their advocacy of this sort of liberalization? Or have I just missed it? I think you just missed it. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure whether, whether airports are more uh, advocative towards uh, less liberalization. I don't, I don't believe so. No. I'd say I didn't mean that they were arguing against it. I just haven't heard them working with their legislators, working with their administrations, and seeking oh more market access. I take it that in Europe, of course, we have a lot of liberalization. We certainly have it uh, uh, in a lot of other places, but there are still pockets of resistance. And uh, well, I, I, can, I can guarantee that a lot of fights happen behind the screens on this particular issue. Absolutely. Please. Good morning. My name is Vanya Ivanova. I'm working at the European Commission, uh, Director General for Transport and Energy. And I'm quite interested, as Bulgarian, as a citizen of Europe and a global citizen, uh, in the, the day's topics, especially because we, you deal with here with also mobility of people and educating people to travel and exchange, but also preserve their local cultures. And I see here, we, uh, as we are in Leipzig, that we really want to, to change Eastern Europe to become as modern as Western and also other places of the world. I want to ask this partnership, how it works between East and West or, or, or between other continents and Eastern Europe and how far we can get in promoting human resource development to work the best, let's say, because we have multicultural environments. We have a lot of people who do not speak the languages we, we really use in the, these environments at the airport. We need more and more people facilitating travel through English and, and, and also other tr uh, training, very hard today in this uh, downturn and in the global economy to cope with the challenge of the human resource development. How do you do with this pressure and how do you push for more and more change in the Central and Eastern Europe and also down to other places? Thank you. And who are you putting that question to exactly? Uh, to, to, to partners on your, t okay. on your own table, thank you. I, I can give you one answer on that, uh, how we do it in, in Frankfurt, for example. So, yes, you're absolutely right. We have more and more passengers coming from areas uh, who do not able to speak English in a manner, um, and they do not have too much experience in traveling. We have about a welcome service which supp supports about 50 different languages. So from that point of view, they get to first help to identify the right way to go to the gate or to go to the shopping mall, etc. Any other responses? Um, any other questions? Yes, Tay. Tay Um. Thank you very much, Tay Um, uh, University of British Columbia again. Um, my question is that the um, uh, delayed the airports sort of market power related to origin destination passengers. Um, for the case of major hubs, when you have more than 50% of passengers are connecting, then the airport has less power. But uh, when you deal with uh, major, you know, the origin destination passengers are major, such as Sydney, Montreal, uh, that uh, the demand elasticity, price elasticity of the airport, because a small air, air, air travel cost, small proportion, the airport cost is very small proportion 
let's say, uh, 6 to 8 percent of airline cost. Because of that, the demand in the price elasticity of airport services are very, very low. Now, you do have a market power in those cases. Now, uh, if, if there is no regulation, uh, such as virtually no price regulation in Canada and the, uh, uh, Australia, that uh, you could uh, unbundle services, raise actual prices to airlines. And this may, in fact, have negative consequences for the um, for traveling public and to the communities. Now, uh, in addition to this issue, now in terms of increasing competition, I'd like to raise second question, which is maybe directed to uh, uh, the uh, probably more closer to skipper situation. For the case of people, now you are dealing with major carrier, which is the um, uh, which is the, uh, uh, the, the you know, Air France KLM. Uh, now, when you deal with this uh, major carrier, uh, you are in fact limiting, uh, in a sense, uh, airline airport cooperation lead to limited access for the other alliance carriers, such as Star Alliance and the uh, uh, one, one World. Now, wouldn't, wouldn't this sort of have long-term consequences for development of Netherlands and, and surrounding communities uh, if you do have a too close a cooperation with a dominant, dominant carrier that the Air France KLM? So I'd like to have your answer. The first question, I'd like to have uh, answers from uh, both airline panels and airport panels, please. Thank you. Anyone have a response? First a question was, I think, more to Montreal and to Sydney. In the case of Montreal, uh, and coming back to the partnership issue, um, the fact that the airlines are saying, oh, we're bringing passengers to you, we should be can, we should be we should be rewarded for this. Uh, Montreal, well, it's a big O and D airports, and the airlines are not coming to Montreal because there's an airport. That's for sure. But they are not coming to Montreal. They're coming to Montreal because there's traffic going there back and forth. So, if we want to partner with the airline, with, with, with the if the airlines wants to partner with the airports and vice versa, we need to understand what the market is. They're not bringing passengers to the airport, they're just flying in Montreal because there's a market over there. And the, the price at that, in that regard is, is quite sensitive because of that market. And we're a bit of the, the, the Amsterdam of, uh, of, of Canada because we could effectively lose traffic and have all the big, big you know, regional airports leading, feeding Toronto or New York and, 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 and allow people to fly in and out. So in that regard, the competition serves uh, the, our market quite well in terms of we need to be conscious of our cost in Montreal to keep the traffic and the service to the community in, that, in, 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 in and out of Montreal. Uh, and my answer is along similar lines. Um, I, I think it's potentially misleading to talk too much about the elasticity of demand of individual airline passengers. In, in the airport context, I think the elasticity of demand of a flight is far more relevant. So uh, the, the primary relationship is, is between the airline and the airport, and the airline will make a decision about the yield of an overall flight. And that's where the price elasticity is probably more relevant. Uh, and in terms of your question about unbundling services to try and charge more in aeronautical charges, uh, one other uh, item uh, in relation to Jeff's earlier question that I have seen change as well over time at the airport is an increasing awareness and sophistication about the total uh, product value of a passenger. So uh, the airports, and certainly not Sydney, no longer think about the value of an aeronautical charge. Oh, and there's retail. The, the retail contribution or the car parking contribution of an individual passenger is extremely important. Uh, and the incentive is not to, to to charge as much as you can in an aeronautical charge and just hope for the best with the rest of it. It's actually to optimise that total return. 
Uh, I wanted to just change the direction of the conversation for a brief moment uh, before we conclude with our airport operators and ask about the relationship between your businesses and the infrastructure which the government provides for air traffic management. A lot of the congestion in the air transport system has nothing to do with inadequate runway space. It has to do with weather. It has to do with uh, vectoring and uh, traditional ways of managing traffic. As the world transitions to uh, a state-of-the-art technology, more satellite-based navigation, greater capacity in the sky, uh, do you anticipate more pressure uh, for, on the infrastructure as a result of closer separation standards, uh, vertical and horizontal? I mean, a, a whole variety of efficiencies are likely to emerge in, in air ATM, which will create, I think, I'm, I'm really asking the question, create a, a, a whole new set of pressures on the ground, uh, which you're going to have to deal with. First, I think uh, we hope, and it was mentioned this morning, that the airport concept will go through the cabinet uh, on Wednesday, because that's a clear commitment uh, from the federal government in Germany that we need additional infrastructure on the ground uh, if we want to go in the long run. Second, I think on single European sky, we can just support this. It's going absolutely the right way. We have a lot of inefficiencies there, and uh, with single European sky, um, yeah, it's going the right way. It takes just too much too long. That's another point. Um, third, we need new technologies like GPS, satellite navigation, and so on um, to fly more efficient, but on the other side also to take the, the noise argument uh, on ground, uh, municipalities surrounding the airport um, more important and to find um, ways to fly curved approaches around cities uh, on the way to the runway. So these are the three main topics I see over there. Um, we don't have that much uh, air traffic control capacity issue in Canada. Uh, pressure, sure enough, when you plan for the future and you look at the, uh, the demand of the future demands, we need to make sure that the uh, the uh, ATC capacity is linked to the uh, airfield, and that the airfield is linked to the terminal building. So, uh, ex improving the access, the air access in, 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 in at any airport has some pressure on the ground for sure on the terminal building. But that has to be taken in consideration in the planning phases and making sure that you have the right design for to balance it off. It's just a conversation that's taking place right now uh, with government as as we move into a next gen in North America and we move into a, a Cesar uh, model here. Yes. Yeah. Well, I I believe that that uh, developments at ATC are uh, well, they are promising, but they are taking far far too long. And before Caesar will be really operational, we will be 10 years further. And so I believe that the threat that that will result in further pressure at the ground, well, we can cope with that threat, and uh, no problem at all. And, uh, uh, but, but we have to move forward quicker there than the current pace uh, over the last 10 years. And, uh, and uh, I, I don't know how to motivate that further, actually, uh, except that putting more pressure, but more pressure not always helps. Other hands, questions, comments? I see one. It works, yeah. Mark Thomas from Director General for Transport and Energy of the, of the Commission. I just would like to add something on this particular point on the improvement of ATM and its consequences on the ground. We have adopted uh, a comprehensive view and a comprehensive plan. At the same time, we also want to improve capacity on the ground. Uh, it is true that through Single Sky and, uh, and uh, the Cesar Initiative, uh, we have already do and we continue to do a lot to increase ATM efficiency, but we do the same exercise and notably through Cesar as well to increase capacity on the ground as well. So this pressure normally, this problem 
should not take place in future. Uh, Dr. Niemeyer. When I started working with airports, that was 20 years ago, and the managers were public administrator. They were former, then become CEO. So now, I see, you have a di different attitude. You are now the entrepreneurs going into this airport business. And there I wonder, why are you happy with cost plus regulation? Because after all, cost plus simply gives you a rate of return of perhaps a little less than the WAC, four, five, six, not very sexy at all. So given that attitude, I mean, you can either be making a lot of proper pro uh, profits with shopping malls, but then you're not a real airport, not an aviation entrepreneur. That's also something, doing shopping malls, yes. But why are you an airport manager? Why are you not trying to make profits out of your core business? And why are you then not opting for a different system? Thank you. Well, uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, you could say, uh, do you really, can you really talk about non-core and core business uh, of what airports currently are? And I must say, I can live with an, uh, a dual steel mechanism plus cost plus. And, and I see the theoretical problems with cost plus. And it's up to us to prove that in practice they are not really that working that negatively as you, as you think they are. And, and our uh, retail business and our real estate business are elements where we can put a lot of entrepreneurial uh, uh, challenge in. And, uh, and, and you have to look at the total. And as an entrepreneur you have to look at the total. And that's what we do. Yeah. So you can't, and, you, and I think that in the current environment, by the way, this whole idea of whether we should change systems and change cost plus, I don't believe is that relevant in the current crisis we are in at the moment. And that's also from an entrepreneurial point of view an issue to look at. Do any of our airline representatives have a view as to whether or not they're happier with a, uh, a cost plus arrangement at an airport or a, a, a cap uh, of some kind? From a United States standpoint, um, clearly uh, the cost plus or actually a single till is, is over the long term has, has benefited us, I think, from keeping costs down. And you know, it was mentioned earlier that the costs are a small portion of our total costs to actually operate, but what we need to have the airports understand is that on any given flight segment, they're the variable component. Because if I've got an aircraft and I've got crew and I've got flu and the, I mean a crew, um, fuel, and it's, um, the segment's about the same, at the end of the day, it's the cost on either end that are gonna drive where we take that aircraft from, from a cost standpoint, um, assuming the revenue models are similarly sized. So, um, it, it clearly isn't a huge component of our cost, but it's clearly critical for us to make a profit long term. So. Any other questions, comments? What Professor Niemeyer is saying, in effect, is that if, if you put a, a cap in place, if the regulator is putting a cap in place, uh, it's, it's compelling greater efficiency and giving the possibility of greater profits, presumably favorable to the airlines because you have predictability as to what the charges will be, uh, it just produces uh, greater economies, as I understand the argument, uh, in the airport operation itself. I don't, I don't have, uh, I, I'm interested in, uh, in Jos Nyhus' uh, response to the notion of a, of a core business. I remember uh, Bob Crandall, when he was chairman of American Airlines, saying that uh, while his core business was the airline, the fact is he was only able to make money with his, his reservation system. And if he had the choice of getting rid of one or the other, he'd get rid of the airline. So it kind of called into question <laughs> what his core business was. An entrepreneur, I suppose, uh, just wants profits from whatever businesses are there. Anything else? Yeah, that's right. Well, if, if airlines want to save further costs by reducing uh, the quality of meals on board, we at the airport are more than happy to provide them uh, so that people can carry it on board. And, uh, and that are the entrepreneurial possibilities you see. 
uh, and uh, and are, are sufficient possibilities to uh, to to work along that uh, that route. I would say. I think we've taken this uh, conversation about as. Uh, oh, there's another hand. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to know if that's true. Why haven't the airports done a better job of making food available to people who are getting on airplanes? <laughs> when were you in Amsterdam last, last time? Well, if you go to U.S. airports where the U.S. airlines have basically gotten out of the food business and, and left it to customers to fend for themselves, it still is a hard problem to get a decent meal to walk on the airplane with. You have to walk back to a restaurant. You have to get them to package it for you, all of those things. Be very convenient if you really are partners Absolutely. to arrange for this kind of service. But I think you should fly through a JFK Terminal 4. And, uh, Not if I can help it. And, and <laughs> No Terminal 4, that's pretty good. And excellent, excellent meals, by the way. And that's not a coincidence, by the way. <laughs> the good news is that uh, the Transportation Security Administration will let you take the meal on board now, whereas uh, you could have brought it to the gate a while back and you would have been confiscated. So <laughs> we're making slow progress. Uh, thanks to our panelists. Let's give them all a round of applause, please. We'll adjourn for lunch. It is upstairs, I understand. And that will be until 2.30, when we'll resume in this room. Thanks very much. <laughs>